a very good evening to all the listeners uh welcome back to the online lecture series of the preparation for uh, the assistant professor eligibility examination uh we have so far completed nearly 5 to 6 lectures on various topics and today we have once again met here on this online platform to discuss on a very prominent a very important topic which is there uh, for your syllabus and which is a very crucial part of english studies across all the departments in various colleges and universities that is literary criticism and theory and for many of the people uh, these two topics are uh, seem to be difficult um because there are some conceptual uh, points to be focused on especially when it comes to theory part uh, it seems to be a little difficult because it is interdisciplinary multidisciplinary branch of studies uh, so we thought of uh, inviting a very resourceful knowledgeable person with us today so here we have with us dr shrikant today so let me introduce him to all of you first of all uh, i welcome you sir to this series of online lectures i am happy sir. to thank have you, you in this series thank you sir so, thank you so much dear listeners uh, dr shrikant sir uh, he, uh, is presently working as head of the department and assistant professor in the department of english government first grade college at manhalli in bidar district of karnataka sir is a native of basav kalyan taluk and he has completed his <coughs> education that is post graduation in english literature and uh, sir has also got ba degree along with his ma sir has completed phd on select satirical novels of aubrey menon an indian english writer from gulbarga university um uh, along with that i am very happy to announce that sir has also cleared the prestigious ugc net examination and uh, is um uh, is very i mean uh, and that gives us uh, happiness that gives us pleasure to welcome him because net is something that is a very difficult nut to crack and sir has cracked it uh, along with this sir has a work experience of 4 years as assistant professor and head of the department in the government first grade college manahalli sir has also served as a pu college lecturer in english for 8 years he is also a member of indian association for canadian studies member of kannada sahitya parishad and member of karnataka government big college teachers association of karnataka he has undergone uh, lots of training programs like orientation programs uh refresher courses faculty development programs and workshops that are required for english teachers he has published several papers in various national and international journals along with that he has also published a book on aubrey menon a brief history of indian uh, sorry a brief history of english literature uh, the book is uh, in process it will be published soon so we wish you all the best for this book sir and sir has another project on his hand that is anita desai anita desai's bomb gardener bombay and kamala markandeya's nowhere man a comparative study this this is another ongoing project which sir proposes to do sir has also presented lots of papers in various national and international international seminars and he has also delivered keynote addresses and speeches as a resource person in various colleges uh with this brief introduction i welcome uh, dr shrikant sir to this online lecture series we are happy to have you as a resource person here and uh, uh, we are sure i'm sure that your uh, knowledge will be definitely beneficial for all the aspirants sir uh once again i welcome you to this lecture and now over to you sir thank you uh, professor achay yadi sir for uh, introducing me in a very amicable way and uh, 
uh, every time whenever i needed you just uh, went on helping me uh, whatever the doubts i had about all these lectures and all everything i first of all from the bottom of my heart i thank uh, uh, the vice chancellor of uh, karnataka state women's university vijaypura and uh, even the other officials like uh, registrar uh, and uh, my special uh, thanks uh, it goes to dr prakash badiyar sir who the other day we met over there in uh, kalburgi i listened to him he listened to me there was one particular workshop i thank him for inviting me over here the other day he asked me to just come i straight away i just said yes this is because we have been venturing out in many ways so uh, i also congratulate him and even akshay yadi sir for uh, organizing such a noble venture uh, which is catering to the needs of all uh, the aspirants of first and professor post and uh, i congratulate all the resource persons who have been delivering very voracious and very resourceful uh, lectures and uh, they are uh, clearing the doubts of uh, uh, these all the people and uh, um, some of the other way they are doubling the knowledge and uh, in many ways uh, those who sir have worked offline uh, on on the stage and off the stage uh, to make this particular uh, noble venture to be successful i congratulate them i uh, also congratulate all the uh, viewers who are here they have been clearing uh, they, they are they have been watching and viewing uh, these all the lectures uh, for 6 7 days and uh, getting their all uh, uh, doubts cleared and uh, they are doubling their knowledge and uh, they are being shown different kinds of ways in what uh, in in which way we have to prepare for this particular uh, recruitment examination so before i uh, would begin i just would like to uh, mention one particular scene of a uh, of a great biography which i consider to be the great uh, biography just because uh, this biography uh, of uh, david hartman who uh, challenged uh, all the ways all the norms of uh, the world some other the way he became a doctor many negativities he just uh, somehow cleared it out and uh, some other the way he became the world's first doctor he has been my inspiration i read uh, i read him often uh, his uh, biography uh, often i read uh, every time i read i just get goosebumps it's just because his uh, efforts you know what he put and made all the uh the people uh, who ever were apprehensive about his uh, uh, his venture his uh, uh, struggle right somehow he made them to just convert into uh, positivity and they started looking at him in a positive way when he became a doctor mm -hmm. the one particular scene in that biography so what happens is that david hartman he takes admission for uh, science in a normal uh, school where the normal students study he was a blind person and when he takes admission over there uh his professor uh, his name i still remember his name is ralph kevalier a biology professor he says that uh, oh come on you can uh, you cannot do this it's just because you are blind how can you be, uh, become successful and there's no provision for you that to be a doctor it's just because there's no one in the history a blind person in the history who could become a doctor so you cannot you should not you just better opt out that one and better opt psychology history some other subjects so that those uh, will definitely help you out rather than this biology or some other thing is just because there uh, to do uh, we can say practical we need to have eyes so at that particular situation david hartman gives a befitting reply and that reply i just would like to quote over here he says look professor you call me as blind and you call me as a handicapped person but i don't consider myself handicapped at all my definition of handicappedness is something different i feel a handicap is a person who has everything but still cannot do anything in his life so this particular reply which somewhere stuck in my mind from the time when i read the, the biography of uh, uh, david hartman uh, who made uh, which is uh, the impossible thing possible that ultimately he became a psychiatrist 
and it's just because he wanted to help uh, uh, people like him and uh, in many ways many challenges uh, he somehow right faced and resolved them so this is the human spirit that does not have any kind of a boundary sky is the limit where we do not have uh, a boundaries for the spirit we can do anything and everything but thing is that we need to have devotion determination and dedication i think this is the test of time for you all so uh, with this uh, particular uh, scene in that particular biography of david hartman i also want to move on with uh, one particular statement uh, not statement exactly there is a stanza uh, in uh, robert browning's uh, poem that is epilog a very beautiful poem in that is, there is a third stanza i just would like to recite that particular stanza it 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 just gives us a lot of uh, we can say energy a lot of uh, courage to face whatever the kind of exam uh, we 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 just uh, uh, face or to write now this particular i think stanza would definitely give a lot of energy to you all one who never turned his back very beautiful uh, line it is one who never turned his back but marched breast forward never doubted clouds would break never dreamed though right were worsted wrong would triumph held we fall to rise are baffled to fight better and sleep to wake such a beautiful stanza we fall it is because we would rise and we fight better and we sleep to wake so this uh, with this particular uh, stanza let me begin uh, this lecture or uh, a talk uh, on uh, the topic which has been assigned to me the topic which has been assigned to me is as you know that is literally as uh, professor akshay yadi sir has already announced uh, there are two units in your syllabus first is uh, let me just open this syllabus okay the first unit that is unit number 7 in the syllabus sorry 6 and 7 literary criticism literary criticism and introduction types of literary criticism function of literary criticism medieval period this is a history renaissance neo classical romanticism and at the end what we have got is 19th century uh, literary criticism and i also will be dealing with unit number 7 literary theory of post world uh, war second and uh, in that we i'll be talking on formalism new criticism psychological criticism marxist criticism structuralism and semiotics post structuralism and deconstruction new historicism and cultural studies post colonial criticism and feminist criticism i'll be talking all these on topics but before that i would like to let you know that anyway we are limited to this particular uh, this much amount of time so i can i cannot just uh, complete all the topics but at least uh, superficially i can just touch these all the topics and in what way we have to prepare these all the things and on that idea you will get it and uh, one more thing i would like to bring to your notice that six points very important points i think i you have to remember first one the syllabus of this particular exam is quite different as compared to the syllabus which we had uh four years ago in 2016 and the major difference what we have got the syllabus of that time and this time is that the nomenclatures which were mentioned in that syllabus were specific in nature and the nomenclatures what we have got over here is in this particular syllabus are general in nature so this is the difference and the syllabus of this exam and the syllabus of set and net exam almost 90% of the time are similar in nature so this is the major difference i think we have to keep in mind and moreover of course so here here and there they have given specific uh, in drama you see in novel we see in poetry also, they have given the names of authors the names of novels names of some other the way they have given some things have been mentioned but still i call this particular syllabus in toto right more or like net and set examination so that is the reason 
I feel that the syllabus, what we are, which is there in, before us, and the strategy what we have to apply, is totally different from the strategy what we applied over there in 2016 for the first time when we wrote exam. It's just because at that time one thing, one more pattern I think uh, you have to keep in mind. Their negative marking was wasn't there, and this time there is negative marking. And uh, the second point uh, to be noted over here is that in this, uh, we have to right, prepare this in a similar way as we prepared for net and set examination. This is the only way what you can do. And uh, you have to read each and everything. There's nothing, you know, that you have to uh, opt out and opt in. Understand? So, what I'm trying to tell you is that both scenarios are different. The scenario of 2016 and scenario of 2021, both are different. And the second point, one more thing we have to remember is that the, the nature of asking questions. At that time, uh, fact-based questions were asked. If at all you observe the questions, uh, question paper over there uh, in uh, 2016. Fact-based questions are more. Whereas in net and set examination, you have got reasoning uh, uh, kind of a questions, you have analytical questions, you have got fact-based, of course, uh, they, are, they are there. And uh, we, I cannot just straight away say that uh, the nature of asking questions of that time and this time would be similar. No, you should not. I think you have to give up this particular idea. Don't know which uh, professor was being assigned uh, with this particular uh, task of uh, what setting the question paper, maybe he has got the same mind of uh, a, a person who sets the question paper of net examination. So that would be the similarity. So I cannot straight away say that the, this is the strategy, you follow it and uh, you will definitely get the job. No, it is not so. So what I'm trying to tell you is that, but overall, superficially, I can just say that in conclusion, I can say that it's better you apply the strategy which you applied over there in clearing net and set examination. This is the best way, I think. It's just because you should be ready to answer any kind of a question, like reasoning-based question, analytical uh, question, or uh, fact-based question. You should be ready to answer any kind of a question. It should not only just depend on the fact-based question which were there uh, in the last examination. It's just because this examination is not conducted every is, is not conducted every year right whenever there are the creation of course or there is a vacancy then only there is a notification takes place and there is an exam so straight away i cannot guarantee that there is a universal kind of a strategy that you have to adopt but we can guess guessings are more so that is why i advise you uh, probably Right, more uh, reasoning based kind of a question, analytical based questions also may be posed in your examination. They'll be short. The questions should be short. Take. And the next strategy, uh, what you have to do is that you have got n number of websites uh, which are available, sources, which are resources which are available on internet. That also uh, is a very important thing. So I just would like to mention one particular website. You can just jot it down. If at all, uh, you can just listen to me. If you're observing my lecture properly, then you just jot on this particular website. There is a website called www.fundtrivia.com. Fundtrivia.com. So on this website, we have got many number of folders where you have got objective kind of questions on each and every author, each and every age, each and every concept. The more and more questions you attempt over there, the better your position would be to get this particular job. So this strategy and one more website that is sparknotes.com. In sparknotes.com, there is one uh, particular section, uh, the section which is dedicated uh, for questionnaire, which you have to click and you will find that there are n number of questions. And in funtrivia.com, one, one thing I just left out that uh, whenever you click on the right answer, it will tell you, uh, I'm going to say, whenever you opt one particular answer among the four, it will tell you the right answer as well. 
funtrivia.com even in sparknote.com there you find the similar kind of a apart apparatus where you you see that uh, the question four number questions are asked and you have to click one and answer would be shown to you you have to correct and next one what you have to do is that these two websites anyway they are very much useful and uh, you have got uh, greatsaver.com that is also a very uh, good website that you can refer to and uh, moreover the more and more uh, this net and set examination books guides and all everything we can just say right so if at all you buy those uh you will have in those uh, uh, we have got the uh, set and net examination previous year question papers which are available in those like you have got arihant publication you have got upkar publication many more uh, there is one more i don't know i am not getting the the title of that particular book uh, so you just buy those kind of a books where uh, you have got objective kind of a questions and even age by age author by author the uh, factual ba fact based you know questions would be available over there and uh, even uh, you can just refer to the previous year question paper try to solve them the more and more you solve right, the better your position would be uh, would be there to get this particular job the next thing what you have to keep in mind is that how many hours we have to study that is also a, a, a confusing question for many people right how many hours we have to study it's not the hours you know many a times you know many people ask how many hours did you study sir no it's not the hours is is how much you understood how much you could make and how much you could comprehend and how many questions you have solved and that matters a lot rather than how many hours of course four or five hours or six hours if at all you dedicate you can just concentrate on all the units every day and these are all the strategy i think you have to keep in mind and uh, the websites which i have mentioned that you keep in mind and uh, don't believe that there is one particular strategy which is universal for everything uh, uh, for set examination the the nature of asking question is quite different and nets is a little bit more you no know, a standard one whereas uh, i don't know in what way this uh, the upcoming you know examination question paper will would come and what kind of a, a question would be asked we do not know but we have to be ready if, to have all the weapons in our hand reasoning based questions analytical based questions fact based questions is all type of questions i think you have to just go through and uh, resolve those solve those right so that would definitely help the and the best advice i can give is that take all the question papers of set and net examination I, again i am repeating it just because it's very much important for you all the more and more you solve those question papers the more questions you attempt attempt over there on any website whichever i have mentioned over there the more quest, uh, questions you solve over there in the guides which uh, i have already mentioned these all the things you know definitely will uh, bring you closer to whatever you are aspiring for so with this now uh, let me i hope you have understood whatever the strategies i have told you keep these all the things that jotted down if at all you are um if at all you are jotting it down so now let's move on to the core topic which has been assigned to me that literary criticism and uh, uh literary theory of the post uh, world war 2 today uh anyways 25 minutes which are already over uh 20 more minutes or 20 or 30 minutes i'll be talking on literary criticism from the beginning to the end tier till tier from the plato to from plato to ts eliot and uh, later if at all time permits i can just begin little theory if it uh, i don't know here what exactly my pace of uh, uh, giving lecture um, let us see uh, if I, if I, if i can complete today is possible uh, i i can just uh, uh, start with uh, little theory as well today if it is possible if not tomorrow i can just carry on with the same thing so literary criticism so the word criticism derives from an ancient greek term critis meaning to judge literature can be enjoyed in two ways one haphazardly 
a lame man does that, a common man does that. The second one, what we have got is methodical method, methodic, methodological or methodical method, right? Where a common man understanding of a literature is quite different and a person who has understood, comprehended the techniques and strategies to read a particular text. That understanding is quite different. And when you read any text methodically, that particular reading itself is nothing but a critical reading. Understood. The base of criticism is nothing but question. Critical thought began with question. If there is no questioning, there is no interrogation, there is no criticism. And criticism bases itself on reasoning more, analysis more, interpretation more. And it never takes any kind of a belief, any kind of an idea. It doesn't take any kind of a writer or his work for granted. It just analyzes, it interprets that too without any kind of prejudices. If at all you look at the literature of the ancient period, you see that the literature of uh, ancient period was divine in nature. And when this question of religion and div divinity comes, faith comes, then there is no space for questioning. There is no space for interrogation. And it went on for many, many, many years until Renaissance period. Renaissance is a revival of literature. Many classic writers were once again brought and translated into different kinds of languages. Caxton introduced, uh, uh, we can say, printing machine over there in England. So books were circulated with many people. People started to read a lot. And when they started to read, they also started to question the divine literature or divine, uh, we can say, uh, uh, divine power or uh, they started to question the church itself and from where the real criticism begins right so the main breakthrough of criticism that we can trace back over there in renaissance spirit so criticism therefore requires a kind of intellectual freedom if there is no intellectual freedom there is no criticism it requires a kind of an atmosphere where the writer has to comment on those things which haven't been commented or questioned. He has to question. Such kind of an atmosphere has to be created. Right? So, questioning and inquiring should freely be allowed. Then only criticism can right, show its true colors. It, 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 it gets a, a, a kind of a new, deck, uh, we can say, face. A very glowing face, we can just call it as. But as criticism too has got some negative signs, it has got its own limitations too. It is conditioned by the age, time and trend and the mentality of a critic. It's just because we are all the slaves of time and we are all the slaves of our mental makeup. So criticism is also the slave of time and slave of the mental makeup of a critic. So, critical approach of one age or the author right, may be different from of that of another uh, age, we can say. There are no fixed principles of criticism. Keep in mind, this is a very important point I'm making over here. There are no fixed principles to be applied indiscriminately to any kind of works of all ages and writers. The, the decorum of uh, Horace we cannot use that decorum over here in the postmodern world. Understood. We cannot bring all the three unities. It was uh, straight away, you know, uh, violated by Shakespeare himself in uh, 16th century. So it, anyway, it is a postmodern world. We cannot just listen to anyone, and no, and we do not accept anybody's authority, right? So we cannot apply the principles of criticism of one particular age to other ages or other ages authors works we can say. So this is the limitation of criticism. So criticism are nothing more than various interpretation of literature that I think we have to keep in mind 
and a literary activity that uh, advances from time to time right sometimes they are similar sometimes they are dissimilar and sometimes you know even contradictory so these are all the things i think points we have to keep in mind the traditional criticism what we have there is a thin line between literary theories and literary criticism that i'll tell you when i'll just be talking on uh, literary theories some some you know literary critics they say that there is no difference between literary criticism and literary theory so there is a contradiction a kind of a contradiction is there in, uh, among the critics themselves they they haven't come to the conclusion because conclusion is uh, for me is an ignorance so three forms of criticism especially conclusion why i told that is just because we cannot come to the conclusion especially when we are talking about literature we are talking about criticism this is because every conclusion has one more conclusion that leads aporia i think you know uh, derida so criticism it has got three forms legislative criticism one the second one is aesthetic criticism and the third one is descriptive criticism so keep in mind criticism has got three forms legislative criticism aesthetic criticism and the third one is descriptive criticism and what is legislative criticism it just lays down some rules and regulations take the example of horace's decorum which he mentions over the nas poetica so lays down the rules of the art writing largely based on the standard works of the past writers like classic writers like you got sophocles you got many many writers they are kept as a model whatever they wrote and you have to follow their path this is legislatively told and legislative criticism assumes that the writer has only to be told how the work of his own can be made better understood and it addresses itself to the writer rather than the reader himself who is interested to be safe in the hand of a critic so this is let's do where it it gives us a framework where within that you have to play so that is literary criticism then one more contrary kind of a criticism that what we have got is aesthetic criticism where it it treats literature as an art there i think this particular aesthetic criticism you find it with uh, pope and uh, dryden and whereas aesthetic criticism you don't find it with pope and it's just because they believed a lot in the classic uh, classical criticism they believed in rules and regulation they believed in decorum who pope and dryden whereas aesthetic criticism is quite contrary to it which may or may not coincide with religion morality science or politics whereas legislative criticism it just goes on right goes on uh, conforming uh, conforming or coinciding with religion morality or or science or or, or politics right we got a number of example aesthetic critics like we have got sydney dryden addison coleridge walter pater the best example is oscar wilde and the same cult is followed by i richards in formalism so third important form of literary criticism is descriptive criticism we studies individual works aims and methods and effects descriptive uh, criticism is a blend of both where legislative and aesthetic both are mixed together sometimes it can draw its own conclusions individual work it just takes and it just studies it does not apply sometimes all the rules and regulations which are being set the the whatever is being led the rules and regulation the decorum which has been led by the ancient and the uh, middle age critics it doesn't draw them every time it is flexible in nature rather than the best example that would be ben, ben johnson conversations with uh, dumont and uh, dryden's prefaces is also one more example of descriptive criticism so three forms we have to keep in mind one is legislative criticism second one is aesthetic criticism and the third one what we have got is descriptive criticism uh this this part, particular you know these three forms you know they make criticism to be traditional in nature that that is what exactly makes theory to be different from criticism i i feel there is a thin layer in between criticism and theory that we'll discuss in the later uh, stage of uh, this talk now moving on 
of course uh, the classical criticism hasn't been given as a uh, as a norm uh, nomenclature or that has that hasn't been mentioned over there in your syllabus but i still remember ts elliot he says that you cannot understand the present unless you understand the past because past is there in present in the present and the present is present in the future and that makes the the whole time to be timelessness right that that is created out of it where there is past in the present and there is a future in the present even these two are present in the future i don't know that that is a philosophical concept that he mentions so what i'm trying to tell you is that unless we understand the tradition unless we understand the past how can we understand the present so that is why let me begin this uh, a particular talk especially when i'm talking about uh, uh, the critics who existed and their ideas i'll just be discussing three points uh, four points you have to mem- remember when you are preparing for uh, this particular examination especially when you are uh, pre- uh, i'm going to say you are preparing on literary criticism literary theory first keep the critic in mind his read his biography right and his associations the next concepts what he has uh, the different kinds of terms he has coined that also would be asked in your examination and uh, the third one the ideas which are some other the way related to some other author his life the first and the second one the ideas how they are related to right some other author and the fourth one to which movement he belongs you take the example of michel foucault he is he is a, he is a structuralist as well as a post structuralist both roles he plays take the example of death of the author uh, uh, what's his name uh, barts right he is a structuralist as well as post structuralist in what way he make it it makes him to be a structuralist and post structuralist that you can understand when you read him so you have to connect the ideas you have to connect the biographies you have to connect the movements right so that somewhere makes uh, all right uh, uh, make you to understand uh, the concept in a better way right so uh, as ts elliot says we have to understand the tradition so that's the reason i am starting this uh, thing with uh, aristotle or plato which is because they are the founding fathers of literary criticism so uh, criticism begins over there the school of thought begins over there in greece rather than rome of course rome had a strategically uh politically it was very strong but uh, intellectually greece was very much strong and uh, philosophy you know philosophy is very very close to literary theories and literary criticism especially modern literary theories are very much close unless you understand the philosophy you cannot understand these all the things first you understand philosophy read history of um, uh, western philo- uh, western philosophy by bertrand russell it's a very good book you read that and after that you start reading these all cultural theories and literary criticism this is a, this is a base to understand literary theories one one thing you have to keep in mind some other the way complete western history of western philosophy that is the that is the rule understood so now let's move on the foundation stone of western culture that we trace back to plato so he is the founding father of that is why he's he's called as the founding father of western philosophy so when i am talking about criticism i'll 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 be talking on philosophy also just because we are all the result of that school of thought we are the result of philosophical thoughts if at all we behave in such a way if at all we react in such a way if at all we exist in this way just because of those philosophical thoughts just the consequence of those philosophical thoughts and we are here it's a result of that right so we cannot deny philosophy so philosophy is the base for this all just because philosophy bases itself on reasoning understood so uh, factual kind of uh, points i'm making over here you can just take a no- note of this or i can just share i have a document with me so that i can share later when um, all the lectures get over so aristophanes who is called as the father of ancient literary criticism he is the first comedian and for the first time he talked about the duties of a poet and it's only critics who talk on the duties of poets he is the first person aristophanes who is considered as the father of 
uh, ancient literary criticism. Right? He wrote one particular book called Frogs, where he compares Aeschylus with uh, Euripides, where he privileges Aeschylus over Euripides. Right? So this point is very much important in exam point of view, if at all they ask, especially in net and set examination, might have been asked also, who knows. Moving on, classical literary criticism, two important figures that are very important, that is Plato and Aristotle. First, let me talk on Plato and later we'll move on to Aristotle, then Horace, then Longinus. These four important people we have to keep in mind. It's just because from where the philosophy, where from where the uh, critical thought begins, we have to trace the origins and the origin lies over there with Plato. So Plato was, you know, is the right master of Aristotle. He's a father of Western philosophy from where the West, his, his school of thought, you know, from where Western philosophy begins, you know, about his academy, right? And uh, he's the first person to tell that art is an imperfect reflection of the real world. That is why, right? He says that uh, art is an imitation of an imitation, twice removed from reality, right? So Plato is, doing for, is known for didacticism. He, he, he privileged reason over emotions more. And he talked on teaching morality. Morality was a very important uh, subject for him. He was didactic in nature. His teachings were didactic in nature. At his academy, he taught philosophy, natural sciences, mathematics, practical right, legislation, and jurisprudence. And works, very much important. I just forgot that uh, over there to mention when I was talking about what all the things we have to keep in. Even works also play a very important role as far as exam is concerned. So he has written a number of works. There are two works, I think, of Plato we have to remember. One is Iron and the second one is very famous, that is Republic. And Iron, of course, it's a dialogic form. All his works are in a dialogic form. But Republic plays a very important role as far as literary criticism is concerned. It's just because in the book 10, in the book 10 of Republic, and I think you know the idea of Republic where there is an ideal world, right? Where uh, the ideal world is very much perfect, like Ramaraja, where a philosopher king should be the, the ruler and he, whatever he decides, that is the, that, that should be the rule. And he should not decide each and everything on, on, on the basis of emotions rather than on reasoning. That is why he, he always imagined uh, a republic state where uh, philosophers, there, there should be a philosopher king rather than a poet. And that is the reason, uh, book number 10, he banished poets from the ideal commonwealth. It's a very important point I'm making. The book, it is book number 10 in the Republic. It says that the poet should be banned from the ideal commonwealth, right? So art for him is an imitation, as I have already mentioned, by man is an imitation of God, right? So take the example of this particular mobile, right? Uh, Plato, one more thing I just would like to uh, tell. There are a number of things to be talked on Plato, just because we are uh, we are limited with the time. That's the reason I'm, I'm just uh, moving a little bit fast. My pace, I'm just increasing just because I may not be able to do justice with whatever the work has been assigned to me. So uh, take the example of this particular mobile. Uh, the the idea mobile it already exists over there. He believes that he, he believes in one particular his theory is that his theory of form. There is one particular ideal state where uh, all the ideas reside, and uh, the copy of that what we are, what exactly we are living is the real world. That is ideal world, and this is real world. The idea of mobile exists over there in that particular ideal world, which is being created by God. And that concept is copied over here in the real world, one time copy. Where it is copied? First, God created it. The second, it came into the mind of the man. And the third, the product itself, the art itself. So that is the reason later he says that, right? He, he says that art is thrice removed from reality. One, God. Second one is human mind. And the third, the art itself, right? Art is a third hand distortion of truth. Right? Art is a third hand distortion of truth. And this is a very important point he makes over here. In the book number five of Republic, Plato speaks about the positive view of art. Of course, 
कि स्टेट अवे डजेंट कंडेम आर्ट कीप इन माइंड डोंट टेक मी अदरवाइज यू नो इनिशियलाइज मेड अ स्टेटमेंट दैट ही वैनिश पोएट इट डजेंट मीन दैट ही वैनिश द होल आर्ट फ्रॉम फ्रॉम द रिपब्लिक ही केप्ट व्हाट काइंड ऑफ अ पोएट पोएट और पोएम व्हाट काइंड ऑफ अ पोएम शुड बी एंटरटेनड द पोएम्स व्हिच कैन वी कैन से एडमायर मटायर्स हु डाइड फॉर द स्टेट सच काइंड ऑफ पोएम्स कैन बी राइट अलाउड and that is the reason you know uh, homer take the example of homer who uh, spoke a lot on love uh, hate relationship no everything many things he talked on he, he doesn't want such kind of poet to be included in the republic that's the reason he bans uh, homer from his republic and he wants to entertain only such kind of an art which can contribute to the ideal state right and such kind of an art he believes that it can uh, it can constitute a kind of a spiritual growth right and he never entertained pleasure aestheticism he was totally against of he believed in directism morality more so he he said that truth is the end of imitation not pleasure oscar wilde once again let me connect oscar wilde is quite opposite sydney is quite opposite to plato even his own disciple aristotle was opposite to him he opposed whatever he said did you understand so these all the points i think you have to keep in mind uh, 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 about plato and let's move on to aristotle aristotle right he's from stagirai and uh, he was a person who used to travel from one particular place to other particular place and uh, he established one particular academical lyceum in th- 335 bc i think right and uh, uh, he taught maths political philosophy that's why he's called as the father of uh, political philosophy or polit- political science and is also the father of biological science and is the first person who could divide uh, all the uh, the the knowledge system into different kinds of disciplines and he has written n number of books 400 volumes of books are available with us he spent around 20 years uh, with plato in at his academy and uh, he is a scientific critic who uh, whom t s eliot admires him a lot and uh, he was the first man in history to expand certain principles of art See, this is a very important statement. He was the first man in the history to expand certain principles of art based on pure aesthetics. His guru, his master, talked on morality a lot. He was didactic uh, philosopher or didactic critic who gave didacticism more. Uh, he gave or privileged didacticism over aestheticism. So, first philosopher what we have got is or first. a uh, critic uh, of aestheticism is aristotle so he was a scientist experimentalist he was a realist so n number of books he has written the very very important seminal book i think we have to keep in mind are two first one is poetics and second one is rhetoric poetics you know so it just deals with the art of poetry and uh, rhetoric it just deals with the art of uh, uh, speaking understood and for us what is major uh, important thing is nothing but the book poetics it is because uh, in this we have got n number of uh, references which could uh, later uh, decide the future of uh, the way of uh, uh, literary creations and moreover the concepts also we have to keep in mind concepts what he has introduced in his poetics there are some there are n number of concepts i don't want to talk on it is because i have to move on some all the way so my means is mimesis is the uh, the term uh, that was first for uh, plato also uh, he used it for plato mimesis is bad for aristotle he says that mimesis means imitation and uh, poetic imitation is an imitation of human action he says right he also says that right straight away he rejects uh, plato just because he was against of mimesis and for him mimesis Uh, is not just a slavish imitation it is something beyond it and it is he, he calls it as creation mimesis creates something and it projects the reality of the real world so this uh, this is a very important concept i think we have to remember the next one is catharsis purgation where uh, this particular concept appears twice in that poetics book and uh, cleansing of heart uh, of the harder passion by rousing feelings of fear and pity there is a definition of tragedy i think you just go through it 
of uh, Aristotle through suffering and death of the tragic hero, leaving spe uh, spectator in a calm mind where you just go and watch watch uh, a tragedy or or, or uh, it is you know he uh, one more thing I we have to rem uh, remember is that he privileged tragedy over comedy and other genres, right? And on, on this particular statement, what uh, Aristotle gave, uh, especially this particular term, Kadarsis, purgation, now, there's one, uh, uh, we have to link this particular idea with uh, one more uh, writer that is uh, F.L. Lucas. He, he comments on this uh, concept. He says that theater is not a hospital where you go for purification. Did you understand? So this is a, one more, uh, we can say, uh, um, perspective to look at where uh, you're not... <laughs> Right, going to theater to purify your emotions. That's, that's why that's the reason you know he just gave that statement. So one more concept what we have got is a hamasha is a tragic flaw. Right, the word has been taken from uh, archery. Right, to miss the mark. That's the meaning of it. And we have got uh, uh, Saint John's uh, Gospel in the Bible where hamasha means right means sin. So here in poetics, hamasha is a flaw. Right, tragic flaw. And uh, three more concepts I think we have to keep in mind. Uh, anagnosis, that is nothing but recognition, realization of his fault. Take the example of Sophocles' Oedipus Rex, where he comes to know that he, has, uh, he, he recognizes that he has got married to his own mother. And uh, out of which what exactly happens is a peripeche. Peripeche is nothing but the reversal of the fortune takes place. Earlier he was he was uh, uh, what, uh, uh, brought up over there in somebody else's house in a poor uh, dwellings. And later he became a king after killing uh, unknowingly his father and married to his own mother. When he comes to know that, that anagnosis take place, takes place, where recognition takes place, realization takes place, then there is a peripecia, reversal of fortune also takes place along with it. And at the end, what we have got a tragedy. And that particular thing is called as catastrophe, where the tragic hero ends his life. So these three important concepts, I think we have to keep in mind, anagnosis, peripecia and uh, catastrophe. One more uh, concept that is also very much important, you know, me. And uh, that uh, that means the conclusion of a uh, comedy where uh, all the tangles, obstacles have been uh, resolved and ultimately uh, the, the protagonist, the protagonist and the heroine, hero and heroine, they get married happily. So this particular uh, uh, concept means this, right? So we have talked Plato and Aristotle will quickly move on to Horace. Horace... Uh, lived in uh, the time of a golden age of Roman Empire where Augustus King Augustus was there and he was a uh, he was a contemporary of uh, three uh, two major uh, writers Virgil and Ovid right uh, Virgil o Ovid and Horace they are called prime verse right they lived a, in an age of uh, Augustus King Augustus who gave a lot of importance to literature and all art and all everything so Two concepts, that is classical age and neoclassical age, these two, two different concepts. Classical age is a Roman in nature and neoclassical age is a British in nature. And Dryden and Pope, I think you can trace back over the, the history, history of English literature, right? There is Augustan, Augustus age, right? King Augustus age, right? Why is it called as Augustus age? Just because Dryden and Pope imitated, imitated Virgil, Ovid and Horace. That's the reason, right? So Horace's very important work, Ars Poetica, right? Uh, in Roman it is, Ars Poetica and uh, Art of Poetry in English term. Earlier, the first original title of Ars Poetica is uh, very important to be noted down. That is Epistle to Pisos. Pisos was uh, the patron of uh, Horace, funded him for writing these, his, uh, all these letters. He, the, 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 the work is in the form of letters. That is why it is called the epistles to Pisos. Understood. So many people they have tried translating Ars Poetica, Art of Poetry. Uh, you take the example, uh, Arnold tried, even uh, uh, the modern day uh, many writers uh, tried, and even Queen Elizabeth tried to translate Ars Poetica uh, by herself, you know, into English. And uh, importantly, first person to translate Ars Poetica into English language is nothing but Ben Johnson. The credit goes to him. Right, that too posthumously it was published in 1640. What are the takeaways from Horace? He, he, two terms I think we have to remember. Purple patch, a very brilliant idea that has been mentioned in one particular line of a one particular book, that is purple patch. 
The second one is decorum. Decorum is nothing but the rules and framework, we can say, in a way, to put it in a nutshell, right? Framework, we can just call it as. So, what are the takeaways from uh, Horace? The ultimate goal of poetry is to teach and delight. This is the uh, very important point I think we have to uh, remember. So, Horace was also a, a role model for Renaissance critics just because revival was going on. Classical writers were brought back uh, to life once again. They were read a lot, right? So, these are all the points I think we have to remember regarding as far as Horace is concerned. Next, moving on to Longinus. Longinus, I think you remember him for only one thing that is on sublime, on sublime. And uh, he belonged to the first and the third century of England. And uh, he lived in a, in, in a Christian era. And uh, uh, he's, uh, he, he, the three triumvirs, one is Aristotle, second one is Horace, and the third one is Longinus. They, they started the movement called aesthetic movement. From there only, the, tra the aestheticism begins from there. The source of aestheticism can be traced back. The roots of, uh, we can say, aestheticism can be traced back to these three people, that is Aristotle, Horace, and Longinus. Uh, what is uh, sublime and beautiful? I don't really want to go into it just because I'm running out of time. Uh, it's already been, uh, I don't know uh, how can we manage. Oh, anyways, that's a quite a different. So let's directly move on to medieval and Renaissance criticism from where your syllabus uh, begins. So I just gave you a, a very short introduction of Aristotle, Horace, Plato, and uh, what we have got is Longinus. So medieval Renaissance criticism, uh, it starts with uh, many people, uh, but I don't want to just talk about them uh, straight away. Uh, important critics I just want to talk on. First is Philip Sidney. Philip Sidney is the first Renaissance. Uh, of course, there are many other, they're minor, but major literary critic of medieval or uh, Renaissance time criticism is Philip Sidney's. One particular work I think we cannot uh, forget that is an apology for poetry, which was published in 1583. But later, posthumously, it was it was written in 1583, but published in 1595. So he was a courtier, knight, you know it well, uh, very well, right? Uh, he borrowed concepts of dramatic unities from um, Italians, especially Horace, right? He followed Horace. Even he appreciated Aristotle, of course, which is because he, he believes in the same concept, the ideas, right? So that's the reason I, I told you, you know, uh, before... You study these all the, uh, the 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 later authors. I think it's very much important to study or have a glance over those as well. It's just because we can connect the things. So, uh, defense of poesy. It is also called as uh, apology for poetry. And uh, apology for poetry. Uh, this particular title was given by. It's a very important point I'm making. You can just jot it down. Given by Henry Onley. All Onley. Sorry, Onley. Henry Olney is the first person to give the title and apology for poetry in English. And whereas Defense of Poes uh, Poesy, this particular title was coined, uh, sorry, uh, given by William uh, Ponsonby. Ponsonby. William Ponsonby. And Apology for Poetry was given by Henry Ol uh, Olney. So, Sidney, he himself did not give the, this title. Right? And this particular work was a uh, reply to uh, Stephen Gosson's School of Abuse. And... Uh, it runs a very, uh, the title is a very big title, we can say. Uh, that is Stephen Gosson's uh, School of Abuse. And uh, Stephen Gosson, he made a statement that it was uh, dedicated to the right noble gentleman, Master of, uh, Philip Sidney Esquire. And he attacked uh, on literature, poetry. He said that a very important thing. He condemned literature. He called literature is a work of the devil. Who says this? Gosson says. And in reply to that, what he has written is Apology for Poetry. And uh, this particular work has got seven divisions. I, I'm, I'm just giving you factual, uh, we can say, uh, points over here. Right? Seven divisions are there. Exordium, narration, proposition, division, proof, refutation, peroration. So these are all the uh, divisions that we can find in this particular book. And uh, Philip Sidney, notably that he followed Cicero. Right? He, he liked uh, the method of uh, argument of Cicero. Uh, Cicero was a stoic philosopher. Right? Stoic philosopher. He was a uh, logician, we can say. And, uh, you know, uh, the Sydney's definition of poetry, I think that is also we have to keep in mind. That is, poetry, therefore, is an art of imitation. For so, Aristotle termed it in his one words, mimesis. 
and that is to say representing counterfeiting or figure of figuring forth to speak metaphorically speaking picture with this end to teach and delight this is a statement given by sydney uh, the main essential thing uh, thing what exactly we can notice with sydney is that he did not only talked on uh, the aesthetic value of literature he also talked on moral value of literature so two two things he talked together as aristotle talked in a similar way is echoing the ideas of uh, aristotle of him right so he considered poetry as a superior to history and philosophy where philosophy was given at much importance it's in a way indirect attack on plato right plato privileged philosophy or poetry that is why he wanted to have philosopher king in his ideal state so he he privileged philosophy over poetry that is the reason aristotle condemned him and rejected him and the same cult is being followed by these all the renaissance authors just because they the revival was there classical critics were revived classical literature was revived right and they were all read in a proper way so that's the reason adam that's the reason he followed the same cult he liked uh, aristotle's way of uh, understanding literature that he he said that uh, uh, literature is to teach and delight both right values that we have to consider over here we cannot just deny one value and or or privilege one value over the other right so he says that both are essential that to teach right or to delight right hello sir ha huh. no yeah is going on sir i'm sorry uh, just wait just a minute sir when did it stop sir oh i see you check it out sir you have got a problem with you this is live sir still you know i can just see myself can can somebody comment am i audible to you all can somebody please uh, let me know am i audible to you okay uh, okay 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 no problem i just got all the answers okay no problem hope uh, it is going well uh, i think yadi sir i think the problem is with you uh, the network connection uh, i think there's a network connection failure it seems at your end kindly go through it sir anyways let me just continue uh, already time is up a lot to say i don't know how to complete this one uh, this happens to me every time whenever i get engrossed into uh, anything uh, okay let me carry on uh, at least for few more minutes if, if at all uh, time permits otherwise i may not be able to complete the whole uh the uh the project what exactly i had planned uh, yesterday let us see uh how far i can go so he considered poetry as a superior to history and philosophy uh it's just because once again we have we are tracing back uh, to the the roots where aristotle um he rejects straight away uh, plato and uh, he says that uh, it is not only philosophy or reason that is important it is also emotion parallel emotion and reason should go together that's what the blended uh, uh, the philosophy of aristotle i i do like a lot we cannot deny or we cannot reject one straight away and privilege one or the other both are important so in a similar i am i'm this it's all a personal opinion right criticism itself is a personal opinion mental make up we can just call it as uh, has i have already told you in the beginning itself in the, in the beginning itself i told you that criticism too has got a limitation where criticism is a, it does not have universal principles which are which are accepted by everyone in every age right culture counter culture this is there always this is synthesis uh, this is antithesis and synthesis they are all there and it goes on if at all you just go through once again marx i am bringing over here hegel i am bring, bringing over here right uh, uh, from uh, the human history if at all you just go through the human history you find that this is antithesis and synthesis goes on and on and on it does not have any kind of an end at all so even a similar way some people followed plato and some people followed aristotle and sydney is one among them who followed aristotle who 
uh, valued teaching as well as delight both together he plays both of them um, equally together rather than privileging one over the other so privileging one over the other it's nothing but once again a, a politics of uh, ideas anyways let me move on so he criticized uh, the first english tragedy that is uh, gorboduck because it violated three unities once again he is the disciple of rather than saying that it is a uh, independent critic he is a disciple follower of aristotle aristotle said three unities are very much important you should not be you should not uh, violate and he gives the example of sophocles uh, oedipus at rex where it follows all the unities whereas shakespeare just he violated unities right whereas the same uh, on the on the other hand in sydney uh, criticism he says that he he uh, 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 we can say more and more he just uh, focuses on uh, the the rules and regulations which have been led by aristotle that to follow three unities so he criticizes gorboduck it is because it violated three unities and uh, uh, he discussed the function of tragedy comedy and lyric he praised poetry and uh, he insisted the moral value of literature and uh, he was influenced by aristotle uh, as i have already told you to track you take the example of virgil even plato to, to an extent in toto it's not in toto but plato also influenced him it's just because when we are talking about light we have to talk about dark as well some other the way they are right complementary to each other plato and aristotle right they are complementing each other right it doesn't mean that they they are totally different and right? they are one some other the way they are of course there is a thin line that divides them both right straight away well, aristotle doesn't directly reject him he accepts some of the things but he says that in some cases you are not right that's what he says and this is how synthesis goes on this is an analysis and synthesis goes on anyways uh, he was influenced by aristotle plutarch and virgil and plato and uh, he may be called as the first dramatic critic it's, it's a very point i'm making over here a important point i'm making over here is a first dramatic critic so uh, he says that there are different kinds of uh, uh, poetry in ap apology there are maybe he just mentions some of the important uh, forms of poetry that are folk, pastoral one elegic one iambic one satiric one comic one tragic one lyric or heroic as well right so main concept of uh, sydney that we have to keep in mind is that poetry should delight and teach second one uh, he followed aristotle even horace and he, uh, of course uh, to an extent he rejected him to plato he rejected but to an extent he accepted also to an uh, because he praised him in one of his uh, books i don't really remember at this particular moment of time but he praised even plato as well so sydney's apology for poetry is an epitome this is a symbol of renaissance criticism renaissance criticism it's a symbol of epitome of renaissance criticism so this is all about uh, 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 you can say sydney and uh, we'll directly move on now to ben johnson uh, ben johnson is a first poet critic is a first poet critic and uh, he translated horace's ars poetica that we remember uh, i think i have mentioned over that before he even translated quintilian and uh, philip sidney compared poetry and philosophy keep in mind this is a very important major difference between philip sidney and ben johnson philip sidney compared poetry and philosophy whereas ben johnson compared poet and painting so very important point i am making over here philip sidney of renaissance period critic he uh, compared poetry and philosophy and whereas ben johnson compared poet and painting ben johnson said poetry is higher form of an art than painting right he privileged poetry over philosophy sydney and johnson uh, privileged poetry over painting to him the ancient should be regarded as the guides not commanders this is a very important major i think uh, idea uh, that we have to keep in mind he says that we they are not our guides they, they are not commanders they are the guides whatever they say we should not directly take and take it for granted they are not commander they are not delivering a command or ordering something you know they should be treated as guides we have to take their advices that's what he says he admired aristotle but said aristotelian rules are useless without natural talent right they are useless you know 
uh, you cannot follow all the unities. The same thing what you exactly have uh, is with uh, Shakespeare. He straight away rejected all the unities that we can see uh, that, that 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 is very much prevalent in his tragedies. So he gives importance to clearness and style, and uh, he pays he pays more attention to comedy than tragedy. See, Aristotle and Ben Jonson. This is the difference. Aristotle gave importance to tragedy, whereas he called comedy as the lower form of art, whereas tragedy is a higher form of art. And where it, here is quite opposite story. Ben Jonson says that comedy is because he himself has written many comedies. That's a that's a major uh, uh, we can say a focus uh, that we can see. And uh, he says that uh, comedy is uh, uh, greater than tragedy, right? If, uh, and Aristotle somewhere said, if at all you want to understand the true life, then you have to read and watch tragedies. The real life, if at all you want to see, the reality, if at all you want to get exposed to, then you have to watch tragedy. You have to see uh, tragedy or read tragedy. Uh, I would say tragic plays. You to understand. So uh, he says that you know he only it is tragedy which uh, is didactic in nature. Who says Aristotle says? Whereas Ben Jonson says that is comedy also. Even comedy teaches us. Comedy instructs us, teaches us, advises us. How can we deny the value of comedy? It's the main problem with the mentality of these critics. They privilege something over the other, and we we cannot, we do not have any right to privilege anything over the other. Of course, they have their own time context right uh, he gives a stress on unity of action and the same is uh, with uh, shakespeare and uh, in his one particular uh, work that is discoveries is a very important work he explains aristotelian concepts of three unity so ben johnson explains he gives a uh, he talks on the three unities in his particular work discoveries and uh, he was a a judicious critic because he judges on the basis of rules. So he, he uh, who Ben Johnson, right, uh, said that Aristotle was a judicious critic because he judges on the basis of rules, right. Even Ben Johnson wrote on Montaigne, Shakespeare, Bacon. We have got Spencer also. He has uh, written on. Even Dunn also has written on, right. Essentially, if at all you look at the personality of Ben Johnson, he was a classicist in nature classicist right so his famous work i think you know uh, comedy of humors you just go through it and uh, straight away we'll move on to john dryden a neoclassical criticism so renaissance critics there are two sydney and ben johnson important writers of course there are some other minor i don't want to just discuss one just because we are limited with time so uh, neoclassical criticism if at all time permits uh, shall I proceed, sir? Yadi, sir. Sir, I think uh, we can uh, take a break here today. All right, sir. No problem. Uh, we can uh, continue it tomorrow. Is that okay, sir? No, no problem, sir. No problem. So because, I can just complete uh, the criticism and start uh, with little theories tomorrow. Uh, today itself? Uh, if you want me to continue, I'm ready. But the um, thing is that everybody should be. <laughs> yeah. And one more thing is that uh, I need to travel uh, to Bijapur now. So I need to prepare uh, for that. So oh, I I'm see. Planning, no problem, sir. Uh, so I'm planning to leave by 6, 6 15. So I need to prepare. So, okay, sir. Okay, no problem, sir. Uh, shall we continue tomorrow, sir? Okay, sir. No problem. As, okay. as you say. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Um, but uh, let me tell you, sir. Uh, when I, when I was listening, when I was listening to you, I felt that your students are very lucky to have you as a teacher, sir. Because you are very resourceful. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, That's my uh, such an engage. You are role model to all of us, sir. So, it's not like that, sir. I, see, everybody has got the capacity. Everybody is eligible to be. Uh, the, the thing is that only one condition that we have to go on reading. Yeah, that's, thinking, that's wondering. Yeah. That's right. Sir, uh, we shall go for some uh, discussion here. We have some questions. Okay. Okay. And not many questions though. Today <laughs> there are some. Uh, Mr. Vasant Kumar has said, you can read the comment here. Your lecture is amazing. And uh, the same is. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, sir. The same comment has come from many. Uh, and thank I hope so many, many uh, 
uh, listeners agree to what uh, Vasant Kumar has said. Even I agree to it, uh, <laughs> sir. Uh, there was another. There is another question. Please mention minor works of literary criticism. Uh, minor works. See, there are n number. You know, n number of works are there. I think you know, if at all I uh, once again start, I think it will take a lot of time. Uh, the main problem is with the time. See, uh, to talk on literary criticism and literary theory, at least uh, we need to have uh, at least fifteen days. Yeah, that's, that's what I think. Yeah. The required time. Uh, that to superficial information, superficial information. You know, it's a, it's a vast kind of you know uh, uh, discipline itself in itself. So uh, there's a constraint of time. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yes, sir. sir you, uh, for this, you know, we can do one thing, sir. You can just yes. uh, uh, make some document or make some uh, PPT whenever time permits. And you can right. just share the PPT with me so that I oh, can sure. share it to all the aspirants. Sure, sure, on, uh, sure. definitely, sir. Definitely, definitely. Okay. I will do that. Yeah. yeah, that could be a possible solution in the uh, limited time that we have. Sure, sir. Sure, 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 sir. Sure. Okay. And here is another question: Does yes. historical development of criticism mean classical criticism? Historical development. No, I, I don't know. I didn't get this particular question, sir. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, she's confused with the idea of classical criticism. Uh, yeah. Classical criticism, I think it is just a phase in the. In yes, the of course, it's a of it's a kind of a phase, a uh, phase yeah. uh, of that particular. That's phase. just that's yeah. just a part. Yeah, it's just we call it, Yeah, we cannot call it the whole development of. Criticism. Yeah, historical. No, that that is not only the history. There is. A lot of history uh, be, uh, right beyond the classical criticism. Yes. Mm. Uh, another one. Your lecture is your lecture is very good. If if it is possible, take more and more classes, please. Yes, sir. Um, even I would like to tell the same. Uh, let's see if you can engage. Uh, one or two more classes in this particular series, if if yes. time permits you. And, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of course. And the books uh, which I would uh, recommend is that uh, there's one particular book, Introduction to Literary Criticism by Prasad, that you buy. It is very comprehensive kind of a work. Uh, and I have got one or two uh, e-books. I'll just share with the Yadi sir that you can yeah, share. Yeah, yeah. You can just uh, do yeah. that. Sir. E e books you are there with me, of course. I'll just definitely share with them. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yes. So. We have not yet received uh, PPT. Okay, sure. We will uh, once the classes are over, I will collect the PPTs and uh, related documents from all the resource persons, and uh, I shall be sharing the same with you all on the Telegram uh, official Telegram group that we have created. Okay, uh, and I'll, I'll give you the list of uh, literary theory and literary criticism, uh, the list of books, so that yeah. sir would uh, definitely share with you, and uh, you can buy it from Amazon. Whatever the ebooks are there with me, I'll just definitely share with sir. And whichever are not available, that you can get it from Amazon. Yes. Uh, I think uh, yeah, your success, uh, your session was very successful, sir, because we have got such comments uh, saying that your uh, way of explaining was very clear. Uh, you have explained them very clearly. All the concepts are very clear. Thank you so much, sir, for um, this valuable uh, sharing of knowledge. Right, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, so thank you much. everyone, for listening to yeah. me. And definitely, if time permits, in 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 uh, upcoming yeah, time also, we can just have such kind of a sessions. I love to be on uh, uh, with with uh, you all. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, that would definitely uh, right increase even my um, horizon of knowledge. Which is the more and more you teach and read, uh, the more yeah. you prepare. Right. So these are all the things. You know, we can revise. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you so much. So we shall meet tomorrow again, sir. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, dear listeners, that's all for today. Uh, finally, I would like to thank Dr. Shrikan, sir, for having spared his time with us for uh, with a detailed analysis and detailed discussion on criticism. Uh, thank you so much, sir, and uh, thank you, dear listeners, for joining us online. So we shall meet tomorrow you, again. We shall meet Dr. Shrikan, sir with uh, some more uh, points on criticism and theory. Uh, we shall meet at 4 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you. Yes.